Let's continue. Towards the end of the story, we are treated to a bit of prosaic slapstick. Don't forget Cervantes' humor. When Don Quixote describes the hero picking at his teeth, as is the custom. This stock image of the Hidalgo using a toothpick was deployed by many authors in Cervantes' day to mock poor Hidalgos who pretended to be rich by making a public display of being satiated after a meal. And coinciding with Don Quixote's ironic self-portrait, we see enter unexpectedly by the door to the chamber another maiden far more beautiful than any of the others. And she sits next to the knight and begins to give him an account of which castle he is in and how she came to be held captive there under a spell. Notice how the vacillation around the term Alcázar has evaporated. At the end of the adventure of the Knight of the Lake, there emerges a relatively Catholic and Western view of a man's loving devotion to a single woman. For some feminists, this idealization is unforgivably patriarchal, but recalling the distorted personalities of characters like Don Fernando and Anselmo, the problem that Cervantes once resolved is clearly unbridled male sexuality. The story ends with another of Don Quixote's statements on the aesthetic value of the romances of chivalry. I will not expound any more since from what I have said can be inferred that any part that is read of any story about a knight will cause amusement and wonder to anyone who reads it. More importantly, he crosses over into reality and adds a moral value to what he has learned. For myself, I can say that after I became a knight errant, I became a courageous, moderate, liberal, well-bred, generous, courteous, bold, gentle, and patient sufferer of trials, of prisons, and of enchantments. According to Don Quixote's narration and commentary, the adventure of the Knight of the Lake is an organically ordered version of the novels of chivalry, and thus far superior to the type criticized by the canon. But Cervantes's irony checks the spiritual development of chivalric fantasy when Don Quixote again gets carried away by his imperialist dreams. And although I have recently been locked away in a cage like a madman, I plan, by the might of my arm, in a few days to find myself king of some realm. He goes even further. When he contemplates his imperialist dream by declaring his intention to grant his squire political power, he also alludes to a major theological point related to the religious wars between Catholics and Protestants. Gratitude, which remains only intention, is a dead thing, as is faith without works. For this reason, I would want that fortune soon offer me an occasion by which I could make myself emperor, so that I might reveal my heart by doing well by my friends, especially this poor Sancho Panza, my squire, who is the best man in the world, and I would want to grant him a county that I promised him many days ago, except I fear that he lacks the ability to govern his kingdom. Notice the hilarious letdown at the end of his harangue. It's not funny from Sancho's perspective. Now it's the squire's turn to amplify the political and moral decadence of his master. Sancho insists that he can indeed rule, but he offers us the image of a corrupt governor who actually sells out and allows others to exploit his kingdom. I promise you that I don't lack the ability to govern it. And if and when I do, I have heard that there are men in the world who will lease the lands of lords and give them a little each year and they assume control of the government and the lord can stretch out his legs and enjoy the income they give him. Then Sancho compares himself to an idle nobleman and I will take my leisure with my income like a duke. Suddenly the canon intervenes revealing his more rational side when he objects to Sancho's political laziness. The lord of a kingdom must attend to the administration of justice. But the squire won't abide philosophies, and he leaves us with the self-portrait of a selfish and tyrannical monarch. I'll be every bit the king of my realm as everyone else is of his, and being such, I'll do whatever I wish. 
and doing whatever I wish, I'll do whatever I please. And doing whatever I please, I'll be content. And being content, there's nothing else to be desired. And there being nothing else to desire, game over and bring on the kingdom. Wow. What happened to the well-ordered republic which might result from the sanctioned perfection of the romances of chivalry? At this point, the word philosophies is repeated in a mysterious way. We do not know who says it, the priest, the barber, or the canon. Those are not bad philosophies, as you say, Sancho, but even so, there remains much to say on this matter of ruling counties. Finally, Don Quixote ends the discussion by saying that he will only be guided by the example of Amadis of Gaul. The sumpter mule, Athemila, now returns, and all our characters sit down to eat on another alombra, the Arabic word for rug, which they spread out over the green grass of the meadow in the shade of some trees. The arrival of the Athemila and the characters move to enjoy a meal on an alombra in a peaceful locus amenus, all combine to indicate that Cervantes is meditating on the political and ethnic conflicts of southern Spain, or the Mediterranean more generally. These are somehow solvable through movement or activities like storytelling and the exchange of foodstuffs and material goods. Signaling this idea that Cervantes wants to salvage something from the political and social labyrinth in which he has placed us, at this point we hear a loud noise and the sound of shearing or clinking. Another symbolic animal appears. They saw emerge before them from out of the brush a beautiful she-goat, her coat all spotted black, white, and brown. This fugitive she-goat approaches the picnic, and after her comes a goat herd who grabs her by the horns and speaks to her as if she were capable of discourse and understanding. Ah, wild thing, wild thing, spotted one, stained one, how you wander off these days walking lame. Let's clarify, this stained, manchada, she-goat, symbolizes miscegenation or racial mixing, reminding us of Aldonza Lorenzo and Zoraida. At the same time, the goat herd named Eugenio, is angry, possessive, and misogynistic, like Lucinda's or Thoraida's parents. He's also a type of antichrist who still needs a certain Eucharist to be saved. Thus, the canon invites him to sit with them, saying, take this morsel and drink so that you might temper your anger, and in the meantime, the she-goat will rest. Then the goat herd apologizes saying that he knows how one should behave in the company of men and beasts. The priest now recalls the subject of philosophy. The tents of shepherds contain philosophers. In case you haven't noticed, we're starting to get somewhere. The new character wants to tell his story, remember Cardenio. Don Quixote wants to hear it, but curiously, Sancho withdraws, saying, count me out. I'm going over to that stream with this empanada. Sancho knows from his own master that a knight errant's squire must eat whenever food is offered him, and as much as he possibly can hold, on account of they are often inadvertently enticed to enter into a forest so intricate that they can't find their way out of it for six days. And if a man doesn't travel well filled or with his saddlebags properly supplied, then there he might remain as he frequently does, dried up like a mummy. What comes next might get us out of this ethnic, political, and even psychological labyrinth in the Sierra Morena. But unfortunately, our old Christian squire doesn't want to listen.